Hey, welcome in everybody to the next edition of the Sports Fanatic News Podcast. As I am joined by a very special guest in this edition of the Sports Fanatic News Podcast, Roto Rob. Again, we had him on, I want to say it was a little over a month ago at this point. Days clumped together, and I think Rob would agree with me when uh, it comes with that, right, Roto Rob? (laughs) It's all a blur, man, but I definitely remember being on your show and happy to be back. Thanks. Yeah, very happy to have you back on. It's the exciting times of the year for both two of the four major sports uh, in the NBA, who's in the finals with the Warriors up, and the uh, NHL, who the uh, Colorado Avalanche just went up one game to nothing yesterday with a key late tally that was able to get them that. So we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to talk about some NBA and NHL free agents as well that are key free agents. And maybe if Roto Rob is a guy that's like one of those under the radar guys that's probably could become a key free agent. We're also here about that, but we'll get right into it. First and foremost, we should kind of talk on what's on the cusp of the beginning of people's brains that just happened last night. I thought that first, other than the fact that the goaltending wasn't the sexiest thing in the first period by any stretch of the imagination, and I am a big goaltender guy, but I thought that game was a very fun game. For a first game of the Stanley Cup, that's kind of what I wanted to see. You had action early. You had good back and forth. What I was surprised about was how good the Avalanche came out not playing for nine days. And then the Lightning played more recently, and they kind of came out flat. They did show an answer, though, uh, and their answer was really good. Palat's been a freaking behemoth in this playoffs. And then Sergej has been one of the more underrated defensemen probably in the postseason. So I think their battle back was great, but it's just that's the avalanche for you. You can battle back against them. And that's kind of the same with the Lightning. That's why I think this series is going to be one of the best of all time because both teams – You can punch them 85 times, but to figure out that way to get back up. And that's why I think this series is going to be so fun. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, I had to miss game one because I played baseball on Wednesday nights. And by the time I got home, it was too late. But I did watch some of the highlights. And you're absolutely right. Some of those goals were like, uh, but I mean, you know, going overtime in game one, how great is that? Now, Colorado, I mean, man, have they breezed through the playoffs so far. But this is the big test. They beat the two time defending champs. Uh, And yeah, rust, I was wondering the same thing, whether it would be a factor, but other than that second period where they let Tampa Bay come right back, it was pretty close game and Colorado prevailed in the end. We'll, we'll see how this goes so far. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, everything's moving in the right direction. That's for um, sure. But when it comes to uh, the Stanley cup finals, the thing I like the most is, I was concerned about Colorado if Darcy Kemper wasn't fully healthy. Now that he's fully healthy, that's going to really help him. Nothing against Pavel Francois. He's just a backup goaltender. There's not, 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 he filled in nicely, but he's not as – there's a reason why Darcy Kemper's a starting goaltender and why Pavel Francois is a backup. So that's that's all I'm saying. So oh, the fact complete, that Darcy's back is huge. Of course. I mean, completely agree. Where would Tampa Bay be without the play of Vasilevsky in this playoffs? I mean, he took a bit of a step back this season after arguably enjoying a career year in 2021. Yet in these playoffs, he's been out of his mind mm-hmm. good. Like, he, if Tampa Bay wins this, he has to be a top candidate for the Conn Smythe Trophy. And let's face it, if Vasilevsky went down, we're talking we're talking about Brian Elliott and that, and we all know, well, I mean, you never know. He, he, he come up with some good games, but again, the same situation there, right? Like, no disrespect to the Moose, but... Where would Tampa Bay be without Vasilevsky is my point. Yeah, Moose is a good backup, but that's what Tampa always gets in backup. That's why they really liked Louis Domingue. You just need somebody that's a great leader, a fun guy in the locker room, and you're the perfect backup to Vasilevsky because you get to play about 65 games anyway. So that's pretty much what they look for in the Tampa Bay uh, backup. But, I mean, I I think this series now is going to go seven. I thought Tampa would come out better. That's why I said Tampa in six was my prediction, because I think they have the experience in the cup. Uh And the fact that they came back showed that they are kind of the team that can figure it out more than Colorado was just happy to be able to punch back again. So uh, how how many times in these playoffs has Tampa Bay lost game one? You know? I'm not. I'm not concerned. They're they're used to losing the opener and coming back. Oh, but you met, I just you think we'll go seven now. Just because. Oh yeah. Of that I six was more if what I thought was going to happen if Colorado came out a little bit flatter, which was the opposite of what they did because they didn't play in like nine days. Where I thought yeah. Tampa would be the team that came stronger, where Tampa had to battle back and uh, Colorado came out in bunches. So that 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 kind of surprised me. That was the part that surprised me. 
Yeah, you know what's interesting about this, and it dovetails nicely into NBA talk as well, it's the experience versus the youth. The inexperience. I mean, Avalanche haven't won a cup since 2001. They're a very young team. Tampa Bay, third straight appearance in the finals. We had Golden State with a ridiculous amount of finals experience in rings, and Boston without a single player having played in the finals. I mean, I know that doesn't necessarily mean anything in the grand scheme of things, but it's fascinating to watch, you know, how that will play out from an intangible perspective when the pressure's really on. Yeah, no, that, that, that is true. And I think that's why with Colorado, I did like what I saw out of them, but you still have, especially if Brayden Point coming back, he didn't look great in game one, but it's game one after he hasn't played in a multitude of days. So I think he's going to continue to get better. So that's going to be the key player for me because mm-hmm. Kadri coming back is also key for Colorado. But if he does able to come back, Kadri, that would be key. But Point, I think, is the main thing that is why I also picked him because they have everything going in their health way. Gerard and Kadri are out for Colorado, but Colorado did impress me more than I thought they would after the long layoff with how good Tampa of a team Tampa Bay is. These are just two juggernauts going uh, oh, yeah. up against each other pretty much, which that also segues into uh, our next thing, uh, which is the NBA Finals, where I would say that's also two juggernauts, similar to the Tampa and uh, Colorado too, where Boston – very good juggernaut team, but doesn't have the experience in the championship. And who does? The Golden State Warriors, who have Clay Thompson, Draymond Green around the room, and uh, Steph Curry, of course. And then they added Jordan Poole into that locker room. That really helps them out, and among others, obviously. But those, I would say, are the three musketeers, well, so to speak. To me, uh, it's the difference maker's been Andrew Wiggins. He has been a huge key so far, and really using this opportunity as a coming out party at you know what? I didn't realize how good he was defensively until this series. Uh, maybe I didn't get a chance to see him a lot because he always played for crappy teams. And now, of course, he's getting the national exposure. And it's, wow. He he really is not shying away from the spotlight here. No, and I think uh, Wiggins, well, Wiggins always got, I know from people I talk to, um, he always kind of got that, like he scored the, Bland. He would drop like 18 to 20, but it was kind of those mixing points where you never really necessarily noticed him on the court, where now he's becoming a noticeable commodity. And that's kind of the difference that you've seen with uh, Andrew Wiggins, I think, this year into past years of Andrew. It's like he would score the 18 to 20, but it would basically be behind the scenes. And it, you would look at the box where to be like, oh, crap, he scored 18 points. So, yeah. like, it was kind of one of those things where now he's a very noticeable player. He is, and I think what's actually helped him is taking the expectations off of being that go-to guy, the pressure of being such a high draft choice, to being clearly the you know not the the man they need to score like the way Steph Curry does. So he's like a, a complimentary scorer, and that has really allowed him to blossom. I mean, the guy's athletic, solid defender, really versatile in what he can do. And I mean, even the Warriors have expressed surprise by how well he's performed. It's a great fit in Golden State. No, I think so, too. And I think with that team, it's also Andrew Wiggins doesn't have any pressure on him playing for the Warriors. And you have Steph Curry, Jordan Poole's developing into a budding star. And then you have Clay still there that have been the chip guys. He's coming into a bunch of guys that take the defense away from him. So it also is really going to help him out. And I think it was a perfect fit for his career. So, yeah, I definitely uh, would agree with that assessment. But I know on the JB and Steel show that I do with Steel Flyers from the Steel Flyers, we talked about whoever won game five which ended up being the Golden State Dove Warriors, would win the series. That's kind of well with the way the series is going. I felt about it. I don't know if the Dubs will win um, in Boston, but if it goes to Game 7, that is in San Francisco. They're still Yeah, they still play yeah. in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the um, – and that will, I think um, – be them winning anyway but if they win in boston then that just makes it easier for them but if they come back home i think the crowd in san francisco and in golden state with the warriors that's a bar and that's just going to rally them to the win where that's why whoever won game five they now have the home advantage again because even if they lose tonight well they're the home team for game seven so i think it's the cards are kind of in the warriors favor at this point not the celtics well that certainly stands to reason but uh do bear do remember that Boston came back against the defending champions down three games to two to win that series. 
uh, in seven. So, I mean, they've been up against the wall before and responded. So I don't necessarily disagree that this looks like Golden State's year, especially with Boston on all their turnovers, and they haven't really played a complete game yet in the finals. We've seen bits of it, but not a complete game. So uh, having said that, I'm still not ready to count the Celtics out just given their recent history. I wasn't saying I'm counting them out. I was more saying the probability is in the favor, I think, of the Golden State Warriors at this point, where the Celtics still have a good chance. But if I had to spin it, I would say it's 70-30 where the Celtics would give them a 30% chance with the Dubs because they have the winning experience. And now we're up 3 to two, have the 70% right. chance. That's kind of what, like, like well, I don't think they have Let me zero. ask you this then. If Boston wins tonight, what do you change that those odds to for Game Seven, or does it remain seventy thirty in Golden State? I still just go to sixty forty because Golden State's at home. I think Golden State's okay. home advantage is one of the better in the league. So I feel like it would just it would drop a little bit, but it wouldn't go in favor. Of, it wouldn't go fifty fifty. It would still be in favor of Golden State to me, just because they set themselves up to. The, if I was a team and I was on a team and blessed with the ability to ever be that good, I would want to set myself up to, we never want to lose, but if we do screw up and unfortunately lose game six, well, we're back at home to win game seven. So, sure, like, that's what that's you play all season for. Seven. Exactly. Yeah. The so hammer. That's why I think the spot, so. Yeah, there's something to be said about pressure. I mean, no, Golden State has the experience, as we talked about ad nauseum, but just to offer a differing opinion, I suggest those odds go lower that to about 53-47, in my opinion. In Golden State's favor, if we hit Game Seven, but I'm not sure it's 70-30 right now. Uh, I would start it from slightly lower, maybe 65-35. I, I, maybe I'm just, you know, uh, nitpicking there, but I think um, it'll be a little bit more even if Boston wins tonight because the, there's the pressure factor. But it'll be fun to see how it plays out. Can't wait. No, yeah, I agree. It, it, it's going to go down. That's why I dropped it a little bit. But I just believe in. I've always kind of been one of those people that if you have the experience, I'm probably that's why I think Tampa's going to still have a better chance to win the cup in the end because they can get knocked down and they have the experience guys that already won the cup twice, some three times if you count Pat Maroon. Uh, and then Corey Perry's won it already, too. So uh, you have a lot of guys that won the cup in that locker room. So I think that plays to, in my head more than I think it does in some other people. So that's why usually I lean towards those teams where Colorado to me is like, this is the, if they lose the year before they win, so to speak, like it's almost like yeah, this is going to be the year where they were Tampa a couple years back with a like, okay, screw all of y'all we're move out of the way. We're winning next year and we're getting whatever we need to get over the hump. And that's kind of where if they lose, I think if they win, then I think they're actually ahead of their curve. Where yes. I thought this was so like that's kind of where I think the uh, Avalanche are at. Like there's a couple other teams like the Wild with how far they got. I think are ahead of their curve, mm -hmm. and they were they they progressed quicker than most people would have anticipated. So I would put the Kings in that bucket too. Yeah, the Kings are too. Well, the Kings are one of my favorite teams because I've been an adorer of Anzi Kopitar since he got drafted, but. Um, he's a guy that I'm reaching out to the Kings actually to try to interview. So we'll see how that goes. But, cool. um, the, yeah, I, I've always loved the Kings because they always just played with most of their coaches. There's been a couple examples, but usually they just played the right brand of hockey. Even when they sucked, they were a structured team, not like the Flyers last year that didn't know what the hell they were doing from their backhand. Uh, so like they, like they were always a fun team to watch, just a fundamentally sound team to watch. I think that's a good way to put it. Well, I will say this. I agree with you about Tampa Bay and the experience factor, and I was probably leaning towards them as well. But if Vasilevsky is going to play like that on a consistent basis in this series, Colorado's winning this thing. Oh, I agree with that. I full-heartedly agree with yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's spot on. If Vasilevsky's off, yeah, Colorado's winning it because Kemper – because then he's even with Kemper. Because Vazzy's one of the best in the world. Kemper's a very good – all-star level goaltender a very good all-star level goaltender is not mount rushmore so like that's the difference when vazzy's at his best he's up there on the rushmore of goaltenders when kemper's at his best he's up there on the vezina candidates of goaltenders but that's not the same thing so i, I if the, if they 
if he comes back down to being on just the Vezina caliber candidate, then those two are kind of even. So then that, yeah, that definitely uh, spins in Colorado's favor. Because if Vazzy retired right now, a lot of people would probably put him on the Vezina, or not the Vezina, the Rushmore of goaltenders with Hashik and whoever else you wanted to include in the Rushmore of goal. Because there's about 75 different, depending if you're a big hockey history buff and you include guys from the 50s on one word, or if you start at the 60s, or if you, oh, you can't do. really start at the I mean, shit, they were in there with their masks on, for God's sakes, you know, like, you got to give them their props. Yeah, there are some years, though, like, if you go back to the 20s, you can't really, you have to really talk around what the league, like, you have to know the history of the league. Yes. Like, otherwise, you're just, because it's completely, yeah, it's completely different. Yeah, The game's so. so different. Like, even from when Gretz played, he always talks about how different the game is now from when he played, that he would love playing in the openness of the league nowadays. With how open, like Wayne Gretzky playing and how open the league is nowadays without him getting hit off of the puck like he used to back in the day, he might score 250 points in a freaking sh- <laughs> Yes. Uh, you mean like in the, pre- the era where players are protected? Because, uh, I mean, it was definitely more exactly. open when he was in the NHL in terms of goal scoring. But Colorado well, no, plays nobody goal scored without stuff. you because of pads. I meant open yeah. ice. Like, yes, like absolutely. The NHL has created a lot more space on the ice with the rule changes. That has led to more goals. With the padding for goaltenders was naturally going to get better over time because of player safety. Where, but the when it comes to ice creation of opening the ice, the NHL has made that like a goal every year to create more open ice for offense. Oh, yeah. And now that they're with ESPN and Turner, that's going to become an even bigger goal because those are the mega platform networks. Turner might not care, but ESPN definitely is going to be pushing more for offense. I think Turner is more in the book of, they have a lot of those like hard and soul hockey guys. ESPN has Chelios and Messier and a couple hard and soul hockey guys like Weeksy. And then they have mixed in the people that also cover hockey. Yeah, that's so it's why a little pretty much different. every rule change in the last 10 years, virtually every major rule change has been designed to open the game up and create more offense. Uh, the pen, you know That's been an ongoing quest to the NHL. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, I agree. And then uh, we'll go into now a couple guys that are fun to look at in the free agent market. I think one, and this goes to show uh, people can never accuse me of being biased without how much I compliment my rivals, teams, players, especially the one time I had a whole podcast. that I I know exactly who you're going to talk about now. (laughs) I talked about Cindy Crosby for 45 minutes straight and how great he is. Yeah. so if people ever accuse me of being biased, I'll just send them that podcast. Uh, but anyway, what I was going to say, um, one, I'm going to start with Latang because I'm a big defense guy. So before right. we go to Afghani, uh, Chris Latang, um, if he doesn't stay with the Penguins, every other team in the NHL, it doesn't matter that Chris Latang is, what, 35? Uh, yeah, 30. It, like he actually stayed his healthiest in years last year. So that helps him even more. He still is probably going to get a seven million dollar contract even at thirty five because that's how good Chris Letang still has played. Where I could see him going to multitude of teams. Like if Edmonton gets rid of Tyson Barre, I could easily see Edmonton being a team that tries to roll the bank for Chris Letang because he's fifty times better than Tyson Barre because he's actually good at defense. Mm-hmm. Where Tyson Barre is literally only good in the offensive zone. So the. I, I think there's teams, obviously, if Philly somehow got him and took him from a rival, I wouldn't be opposed to that either because they desperately need somebody like that. But I don't see that happening in seven million years. If it did happen, though, I would be happy. But the so I, I think there's a, the Kings are another team because they have money. I think the L.A. Kings getting a veteran defenseman because Dowdy's health is a concern a little bit. We're getting another guy that's a good righty defenseman and a great mentor for your young guys could be a good move for them for like a two-year contract to Chris Letang maybe so like there's a couple teams that I think would fit in um to his boat Winnipeg if they could find the money he would fit in with well too because they don't have a lot of veteran defensemen that are that that are like to the upper echelon all those guys are in their 20s so I think he could even fit in there those are just like three teams that I kind of have off of the top of my head Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the Penguins want to keep both him and Malkin and let them finish their careers in Pittsburgh, but I just don't see how that's going to happen cap-wise. No, I don't see it. I could see them keeping one. I don't see how it would happen with both, and it's going to be interesting to see which one they end up prioritizing at that point, where Malkin, he – 
he has a plethora of teams because I could easily see Stevie Y if he thinks Detroit is ready to actually be in the playoffs with the next year going, okay, well, we've really started proving it this year. I fired Jeff Blashill for a reason. I'm bringing in a new head coach. Let me go get Afghani Malkin. I have the money to do it. Now we have a very good center core with Lark and Malkin and, uh, well, not Rasmussen. What's this other guy's name? But either way, they have a really good three deep center core. And, uh, they're able to kind of roll with that and run with that. And um, that would be better for the Red Wings and what they have now. So I think there's a the Malkin's market is like from teams like that all the way up to teams like the Kings, all the way to teams probably like Boston. So like his market is very vast because anybody kind of would want interest in him, especially if Bergeron retires. But yeah. I could, he's not the same player as Patrice Bergeron by any stretch of the imagination, but like they need a center that is a top player in the league. And if Kenny Malkin went healthy, he's still a points per game player. So, Absolutely. He's still an elite talent. Yeah, he's going to be 36 next month. He missed half the season, yet he's still got 20 goals and averaged over a point a game. I mean, maybe I feel like he got a bit lucky based on his high shooting percentage, so I'm expecting a little regression next year. And that minus 10 is a little concerning for a player with his defensive reputation. But, I mean, he's definitely still an elite talent. He wants to play another three to four years, so that'll be interesting because I'm not sure anyone wants to give a 36-year-old that big a contract. So uh, it will be interesting to see. You mentioned Boston, Bergeron retiring. I think uh, if Bergeron retires... That could really change Boston's course. I, I think they might go into full rebuild mode and look to trade Pasternak and really like blow it up. But if he resigns, they're back all in going for the cup. I think that's going to be the swing factor for Boston this summer. Yeah, it will depend on Boston. If you really think about it, when Boston went into their dark days of like the earlier 2000s before they came back up with the Bergerons and Washington, they never really went into a full rebuild. They kind of just sucked. Like they're never really a team that's going to be like cool we're going into a full rebuild they're kind of just suck for two years and then magically get good draft picks basically and then go okay cool this worked out well and then that's kind of how where i like i don't know boston to me never struck me as a team like maybe they'll do it finally in the current era where more teams are rebuilding but the just their culture of a team never struck me as a team that will ever go into a full bloom rebuild but we'll, but it will be interesting to see that's that that's definitely something that will be interesting to follow they just kind of like us the flyers they don't strike me as a team that's ever going to commit to a full-term rebuild like in the 07 season when the flyers were bad they try to turn around quickly like they're doing this year it worked back then but back then everything was also run differently so it's going to be interesting well, to see how it works now so um i i think that's kind of the big uh, thing sometimes the disconnect uh, I would have. But on the other side of F. Kenny Malkin, uh, I think the minus 10 for him is mostly his injury was lower body. And I think he's not the best defensive player, like you said, on top of that. If you have your legs on as quick, you're going to focus on being good at the thing you're the best at and falter a little bit extra probably on the thing you're not the best at because your legs aren't under you. So I think that played into that a lot, but... We'll have to see going forward. I would still like Evgeny Malkin. Another old guy. There's a lot of good old guys in this free agency. I'm not going <laughs> to Yeah. <laughs> P.K. Subban is honestly yeah. another guy. If you give him a one-year deal, I would easily take a chance on P.K. Subban because he probably is in one-year deal territory at this point because he's kind of lost in this abyss and has to recover his career. But if you give him a one-year deal, he's going to play for the contract, so that might work out the best for both parties. Yeah, P.K. Subban is an interesting case. I mean, yeah, he won the King Clancy Memorial Trophy for his work off the ice. So you know you're getting like a good corporate citizen there, and, that, and that's great. Uh, or a good social citizen, I should say, you know, fantastic. But on the ice, I mean, it's now four years since he had double-digit goals and just five this season. I know it's pretty hard to rack up goals when you're playing on the same defensive core as Dougie Hamilton, but I'm not sure he's the offensive force he used to be and. You know, if I'm paying for more of a defensive defenseman who contributes a little bit offensively, that's going to affect how much money I'm going to throw at him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think he's getting paid. Like he got, He's going to get paid at most, I would say, four. Like, his recent cap, it was nine. I would say he's dropping drastically. I think the most are get paid is four. And that's okay. from a team that really just wants to give him a shot and doesn't really have a ready defenseman 
at all that really fits his characteristics. So they're basically just gambling. Like, I don't even see most teams trying to pay him that much unless if you're good. I would say his market is more in the two to two five, but teams usually pay above market price. So, okay. Well, that, I mean, if you're saying two to two, two to two point five, that basically puts him at a number four, number five defenseman range, right? <laughs> Yeah, that about, but that's what PK kind of is now. Like PK ain't the top three defenseman anymore. If he can't realize that, then I don't know where he's going to end up because it's just his performance hasn't been a top three defenseman in a while. If he can get back up to being decent and adequate, like for example, a perfect example is Jack Johnson has been absolute for the last five years and and then goes to the avalanche this year and now becomes a good average NHL defenseman again at the age of 35 somehow. So like well, there's... There's a lot of examples for if you go into the right situation, it can kind of work with you. Where for me, I think PK would work if they don't get Latang, because I see this being a kind of like dream move for LA. PK, I think, is a perfect one year deal for LA because they need more puck moving from the back end to get to their forwards. And their forwards are continuing to develop, their defensemen are continuing to develop, but they had health concerns with defense last year. So PK will be your like fifth, sixth, or seventh guy when you sign him to a one-year or two-year deal. Probably fifth or sixth if you do two-year. If you do a one-year, he could be your – just whoever. If he makes it as a starter, he does. If not, you do whatever. But I would say L.A. could be a team that has a chance of looking at him because they have the money to take the gamble. And if he does get going again there, his characteristics are really going to help the King. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Eric Johnson, um, or sorry, Jack Johnson and his his bounce back year with Colorado. Because I was looking at that avalanche defense. I mean, when we're talking about the finals, we didn't really get into it, so I don't want to veer back into that necessarily. But I'm pretty sure if I played as a number six defenseman in Colorado, my numbers would be pretty good too. Like, look at that core. Bowen Byram, oh, fourth yeah. overall well, pick in 2000. Bednor. Bednor is a coach that loves coaching a defensive north style system so when you have that as your head coach it's also going to help you fit in nicely yeah well i mean just blown away by that core just absolutely blown away and gerard's underrated in my opinion like people have knocked samuel gerard i think because me and my friend Pirlo that do pockets over the whole time when you're a smaller defenseman a lot of people just assume you suck defensively i don't know why a lot of people just assume guys that are 511 suck defensively but well, a lot of people do, where if you actually look at Gerard, he gets knocked more than his numbers actually show. Even when you look at his underlining numbers, like I follow Jay Fresh, and that's where I get the analytical side of stuff from. He is getting a lot damn better each season defensively and is a very good power play puck moving defenseman where he's a bigger loss in this in this cup for me than any other mm-hmm. series because the power play is big to beat Tampa. Like, there's the, whoever's good on special teams, because five on five, yeah, both teams are great. But then that's why whoever's great on special teams is going to kind of take the icing on the cake, probably. Well, to uh, build on your point about small defensemen, I mean, that's completely unfair. Usually small defensemen are faster and mobile. Not, I mean, otherwise they wouldn't make the NHL, right? That You don't, you don't bring in small well, defensemen. Well, look at Keeman. People... He's one of the best Flyers defensemen of the 2000s era. And what was he, 5'10"? <laughs> Yeah, he was a small so, guy, but he was solid. Like, I'm talking about guys that, you know, you look at and think you're going to get pushed around in the NHL. But then you look at the big guys who do the pushing around. Well, let's go to Risto Rissalainen, who's, a, who's just an absolute yeah. beast. But, I mean, is he really helping the Flyers by bashing people around, putting himself and sometimes his own goalie out of position? It, like, you know, you've got to look deeper no, than he's that. Not, yeah, he's, he's, he's literally... Like, the thing with Risto is he has more talent than this guy. But what he is is he needs to realize, like Branson, Erica Branson did under Daryl Sutter, what he's not. And he's never had a coach that's made him realize what he's not at the NHL level yet. And I think that's been the problem. He's keep trying to be more offensive than he actually can be at the well, NHL level. Yes, he did it at every other level, but it's not working. Like, be the shot blocking, bash the guys at the blue line. But like Erica Branson used to do that his entire career. He would hit somebody, be well out of position. And whoever was his defense partner, just like Travis Sanheim with Risto last year, is like, oh, sweet Jesus, what the hell are you doing? And then had to try to guard a three-on-one himself. So, well, like, 
I don't want to necessarily issue. defend Russellinen, but in fairness to him, he was thrown into a horrible situation in Buffalo at a very, very young age, fresh out, fresh out of junior, basically, fresh out of the draft, into a savior type situation, which he was ill equipped to deal with, you know, and expected to carry this team as a two way defenseman, Whoa. which was totally unfair. And I don't think he ever really had the opportunity to really find himself and say, this is who I am. So you're right. I mean, he hasn't had that situation, but I'm not sure it's completely his fault. No, it I doesn't don't necessarily it's make fault, it better. Yeah. You know what I mean? With Buffalo, it's not completely his fault. Here, though, I think he could have looked a lot better other yeah. than just the hitting and shot blocking because Travis Sanheim last year was our best defenseman. Oh, clearly. So he was playing with the best defenseman on the team, and that still didn't magnify his play it just made him look a bit better than when he was with Buffalo which is not saying much because until this year with their new head coach where it seems like with Adams and he they're moving in the right direction they were not showing any signs of moving in the right direction so that doesn't really say much so I think Risto with Torts that's the coach that I think is honestly going to have the chance he's it's either He's going to really hit with torch, or all hell is about to break loose between them. Look, there's no, there's <laughs> well, no in- Yeah, we've doubled down, so we shall, we have no choice but to watch it play out. No, that's what Mark said with that show that's coming out. He said either way, it's going to be hilarious because we're either going to watch John Tortorella somehow rectify this basically like shithole, or well, you're going to see it all crash and burn. I was talking and about Ritzo so, be- so specifically, but yes, Tortorella is a whole other discussion of madness. Absolutely. It'll be, you know what? Uh, a friend of mine who's a Flyer fan basically summarized and say, hey, at least the Flyers will be entertaining this year. Like, interesting. You know, from that perspective. Like, interesting, like watching the Titanic sink. Because who doesn't like watching a huge ship sink? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah there's a lot of it. Like, the action, like all the Tom Cruise action movies that he's in. Obviously, Maverick is one of the most popular movies out there right now for the, I've watched that movie eight times now so yeah i would recommend watching that movie uh, obviously <laughs> so, so uh yeah there's a lot of film kind of took a dark period for me like i watched a lot of film when i was younger then got bored of hollywood and then lately i think they're starting to put out in the last like five to seven years stuff that has interested me more again yeah, and not just the kind of slap like awful ridden movies but they're just funny because of like how bad they're actually like the room for example like like stuff like that like it's supposed well, to be written seriously but then it ends up being funny because it's not written like well i'd be happy to get into some film talk with you <clears throat> on another podcast absolutely but my point about the flyers was i think that if if nothing else they're gonna appeal to the part of your brain that likes to watch car accidents you know what I mean? Because there is a part. They're going to appeal to the part of your brain. brain that likes to watch old school hockey too, which is what I think I hope the Flyers so. wanted. Because this is a hire that, from at least from everything I gathered, that it seems like from the firm they hired, Bobby Clark and Holmgren were basically the ones that convinced Scott to do that that way. So essentially, the alumni were the ones that hired the head coach. If you wanted, like go by that domino effect All right. so the and if that's the case i don't necessarily mind it because i like old school and i like kind of getting back to them but you can't play just at that style in today's nhl because you're even no. if you do make the playoffs we saw it with nashville nashville with Hines tried to play every game at full throttle and then they were chalked by the playoffs because they were all beat to death so like you have to be able to balance it to an extent as well and I think that's the thing that's going to be interesting to watch with this Flyers team because they're going to go from not being an aggressive team at all to being uber aggressive, where sometimes when you do that, you also become uber stupid in terms of fighting penalties at times mm-hmm. that yeah. you have to be able to balance that out. So that's the thing that's yeah. going to be I mean, unless our penalty kill somehow does a complete 180, that only spells trouble to me. If old school means going back to Flyer roots and winning, I'm all in. But if old school means playing on the edge to the point where we become the most penalized team in the league again, and yeah, we're entertained to watch because we beat the crap out of teams, even though we're getting we're losing and on the penalty a, a huge chunk of time. 
okay, well, that, that doesn't seem like progress to me. That only gets you so far. That's just a more interesting to watch. It's not progress. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say that's a good way to spin, to spin that. But when it comes to the Flyers, a guy that I actually would not mind um, having on our team as a veteran that I don't think would be too hard um, to acquire if he's not able to re-sign. This is also if he's not able to re-sign with Tampa Bay. But Andre Palat would be perfect in John Tortorella's system. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd love to have a guy like that. Like, his defense combined with what he can also produce at least 50 points offensively for you, he's torch style player to a T. So I, <laughs> and, 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 and he kind of reminds you a bit of a wing version of JT Miller. So I think, like, uh, he's another guy that I think, obviously I don't see the Flyers getting JT Miller, but was no. a torch style player to a T. So, like, both of those guys, I, I think there's a lot of guys, honestly, the Flyers could do wonders with getting, because there's a few guys that kind of strike you as like torch style players. Like, for example, Vegas ain't going to be able to pay Riley Smith. Riley Smith is great defensively. Oh, yeah. Uh, so John Tortorella is probably really going to like Riley Smith. I could easily see us going after Riley Smith now that we have John Tortorella. So, like, I think now that we have our coach, it's easier for people like me that try to do videos on where I think the Flyers are going to go in the free agency because you had no idea where the hell they were going a week ago. That well, once this becomes official, you're more like, okay, now we kind of know the style of people you're probably going to branch out and get. Like, if they could pay Trocheck, Trocheck's probably the perfect 2C for John Tortorella, but they probably might just try to trade for Sean Monahan or something because he's cheaper and Trocheck's probably going to get paid like 8-5. So it's going to be like, that's that's how the Flyers are going to have to figure out how to work the business side of things too. Ryan that's, Strome could be a cheaper option than Trocheck if you want to go that route. Well, that's what I was going to say, Joe. Uh, I mean, a lot of those names you mentioned make me salivate as a Flyer fan. But <laughs> we can window shop all we want, but where's the money coming from? Well, Stromer, I would say is five. I would say Ryan Strome is like a five, five and a half. Guy or so, like I feel like the Flyers, if they trade like TK, if that is if those rumors end up becoming true, and you get assets for TK or picks, and you do whatever you can get to get rid of JBR, you're going to have enough to play Strom. The the, the Trocheks of the world, the Goudreaux's of the world, the Forsbergs of the world, those are the guys that I more question if we're going to be able to find a way to do that. But like guys like Ryan Strom. I feel like is honestly a perfect guy for them to get because he's only 28, I think. And uh, he seems to get better with age. So he seems to be a guy that would be good to grab at this time of his career, too, because a lot of the other centers, other than Vincent Trocek, is going to get paid way more than him at the same age or older. So, yeah, and uh, I guess that makes sense. I guess that's the thing there. Um, there is a caveat there that we have to trade Konechny just to clear up space in that instance. And some would argue that trading Konechny at this particular juncture, when his value is not as high as, as it could be, <coughs> is a mistake because perhaps his best value is with us, given his upside, or at least until he gets super hot, like comes off a really big season. We feel like he's not in our plans. But I'm not. I'm not convinced that the Flyers should give up on Konechny as a building block. I'm not totally convinced they should. But the problem with TK is. Ever since, like, I've always been more confident in TK, so therefore, whenever I do talk to people, they tend to try to set me straight with TK just because of how much I like them. So, and like him still, but like, ever since that 24 straight game goal seasons, he had three straight goal 24 season, he's been uh, solid, but he hasn't been TK. Like, he's been playing like someone else, if right. that makes sense. Like, it like totally he's does. supposed to be a guy that shoots the puck more, and now he's turning into like a mini version of Goudreau basically and trying to be pass first and also score. And you're like, well, we don't need that. We have a bunch of guys that are already fast well, pass first. We kind of, so that's shooting. He averaged more shots a game than in any time in his career. The problem is where he's shooting from. And he admitted that late in the season, he finally started actually paying attention to analytics that were brought to him and realized I'm just not shooting from the places where I'm most prone to score from, and he's yeah. learned from it. Which Look at how he ended the season. He was much better down the stretch. Like the last, say, 25 to 30 games, he was averaging, well, certainly leading us in terms of close to a point a game. 
I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were more significant. And the goals were starting to come, not like we're used to, but with more regularity. So I feel like a full season of Konechny being in the right place at the right time, knowing where to shoot from, could send him back to 25, possibly even 30 goal potential. It's going to depend on his line mates because he's not a self-producer. Yeah. But I'm not giving up on him. Yeah, I also think the big thing with Teeks is I don't think Tortorella is going to have too many guys in his lineup. For example, we saw at the end of the season, because of their chemistry from playing internationally, Morgan Frost and Owen Tibbet seemingly get some driving together. So if Frost makes the team, Tibbet's a guy that I think will learn defense more over time. Frost, that remains to be seen. Uh, where um, TK is also not very good defensively. So when it comes to a – if you just looked at John Tortorella teams in the past, he tends to not have more than like one or two guys in his lineup at forward that are just offense. So that's the other side of it that when you have Tippett and Frost ready again, Tippett I think has the best chance to – developed defensively. TK would have the best chance if he played more like almost like when Knack played in 1920 was like a pest on the four check in the defensive zone just like he was in the offensive zone. That's what would be best for TK, but he hasn't done that yet. He only does that in the offensive zone. But if he doesn't commit to defense, one of those guys is going to become an on-man out. And it's not going to become Tippett because the Flyers trade is true for Tippett, so they're going to make sure John Tortorella likes Tippett, basically. Where one of the guys of Frost and TK, I think, would be coming on man out because Tortorella, I don't think, is playing two guys that are just offense. That's just my own opinion, though. Well, no, that's fair because I had not considered what Tortorella's hiring will do from a perspective of our roster. And if that's the and case, we got a lot of, change, lot of changes yeah. to make. In my I, opinion, I think – I didn't mean to cut you off, but in my opinion, I think he might favor Morgan because I've got to – like, when I interviewed Morgan, he's become more accountable, and that's Fletcher. It's like, if you're not performing up to the ability of your full ability yet, the biggest thing – not Fletcher. The biggest thing Torts always says in past interviews he wants is just accountability. Like, yeah, I've sucked at this. I need to get better at this. I need to do X, Y, and Z. And at first, it didn't seem like Frost was the best at that. Now it seems like he's very good at that. So I think because Frost is more of an unknown and Tortorella – knows he can kind of shape him exactly into um, what uh, he wants. I think that's why he might favor Morgan because Morgan might be more prone to listen to Torres because he's where TK's had a lot of success in the league already, but has kind of shaped himself into something that the Flyers are not wanting him to be, where they want him to be more of a guy that scores 24 or more a season. So it's a little bit of a different perspective. So I feel like it's going to be interesting to see where they go there. I think Frost is still in more of his molding period, where TK's still in his molding period, right. but that's if he will listen to being molded, basically. That's fair. I will be interested to see what, if anything, Tortorello can do to improve some of the players on this team. So let's bring it on. I'm I'm definitely all in if you can do that. Yeah, and then we are going to, we're entering like the home third here of the podcast, so I was going to say I'll give it, to you for the NHL, and then we'll get into it for about five minutes, the NBA free agents, and you can say your top three for that. But if you were going into the NHL, who would be, if you were a GM, your top three free agents that would be on your list? And then if who would be kind of that one sleeper free agent that you're like, we should also target this dude? Well, <clears throat> I didn't necessarily prepare to answer that specifically, but I did jot down a few guys that were interesting, some of which we've already talked about, like Malkin and Subban. But one guy we haven't talked about, and it's near and dear to our hearts, of course, is Drew. I mean, where does he go? The Panthers want to re-sign him. They, they're they going to have to move some salary, but he wants to stay there. Panthers want to bring him back, too, so something's going to have to give there. And I'm guessing he's going to seek a, probably about a three-year deal and try to bag that cup at last before he finishes his career in Ottawa. So fascinating to see how that'll play out. Where do you think he's going to wind up? Uh, I honestly think if he doesn't wind up in um, Florida because of the way they're building the direction now and it seems like they're moving in the right direction and have one of the best prospect systems, I would not be shocked if Giroux thinks in the next four years Ottawa has a chance and just goes, well, if they get a goaltender, they're set. And then we'll just say I'm going to my hometown now. I wouldn't be shocked if 
Florida can't figure it out if he just says, give me a five-year deal, Ottawa, and this is the latest contract of my career. Huh. And then kind of just does it that way. Because I do think the Senators could feasibly, if they get a good goaltender, win the Cup in five years because their form system is ridiculous. So well, if, they, I mean, keep, if he's so willing to wait way. five years, he could have just stayed with the Flyers, right? Oh, yeah, but I think it's also – I don't look at things just necessarily from the playing on the team side of things. I try to look at it from the player's life side of things, too. And obviously, I think Giroux might have interest in going. But, like, the, like for example, the main reason the Flyers would get Johnny Goudreau is not because the Flyers are in a good position to get Johnny Goudreau. They're not in a good position to get Johnny Goudreau. What's so freaking ever? It would be because Johnny Goudreau is like, I am a free agent. The team I want to go to is back home, and that is Philadelphia. And there's been some rumors that that's the case. And if that actually is the case, that's how the Flyers are going to get Johnny Goudreau because he basically told the rest of the league, buzz off, I want to go back home to Philadelphia. So, oh. like, that, that's – that, and that's a, where if Giroux eventually doesn't get it from Florida and he basically says – not to that extreme extent, I don't think anybody would say, but basically says, I'm just going to Ottawa, I want to return home, then nobody else is going to bother him. And it's basically just going to be him then negotiating with the Senators about returning home which is what it would be with Johnny negotiating with the uh, I think the big members. difference there is the age, because uh, obviously Drew is heading towards his last or second last contract, just depending on how long it is. Whereas oh, no, Gautreau, I agree. Gautreau will be 29 until August. He's coming off a season where he tied for second in scoring in the league. He basically, his agent probably would shoot him if he said something like that, because he can maximize his value right now. If he desperately wants to come to the well, Flyers, don't, don't get me maximize. wrong. I'll take him. But I no, I think discount. here he would what maximize. Discount? Yeah, I don't know if he would have to take a discount because here I think the Flyers would want him so bad that they would do what, like they would trade JVR, they would trade TK, they would trade Limblum, whatever they have to do to clear up the cap space to get Johnny Goudreau. My perception is they would just say screw it. Right. We want to bring the hometown kid back home. We'll get rid of any of these. Hell, they just. Signed Risto to an extension. If that team wants Rasmus Risto line, and I wouldn't be shocked if they're like, "Oh, cool, we just got five million dollars off of our cap. There's five million dollars to sign Johnny Goudreau." Like, I, I think if when it comes to Goudreau, they're going to find a will and a way if Johnny Goudreau wants to come here, and it's not going to matter who the hell they have to get rid of, unless if it's probably Couturier. But like, minus yeah. Sean Couturier, who I don't think they're trade anyway because his cap hits too high for his back concerns. Um, I, I don't think they're going to care who else they kind of have to get rid of or Sanheim. I would say Sanheim off of how well he did last season. You, He kind of seems to be in that Adam Pellick Islanders territory of ascending in his mid twenties. So I wouldn't want to trade him right now, but there's not, I don't think there's a lot of guys. If you're getting to draw that are necessarily safe minus like three or four people. So you asked for a sleeper pick. I mean, I, I was looking Which is at a fair. couple, I was looking at a couple guys. Now here's a, High risk, high reward sleeper pick for you. It's Evander King. Now we know that he can be a total yep. douchebag. We know that he's a powder keg that can blow up a team's chemistry, could wind up getting suspended for the whole season. Who the hell knows? Wind up dead. Like freaking hell. Like it's a massive risk. But look at the, what he did in the playoffs for the Oilers, the difference maker that he was. I mean, man, when he is in the right situation, man, this guy can score or be a player. So, High risk, high reward, but major sleeper. He he could be a major difference maker for a team one way or the other. If you're willing to, if you got balls and you're willing to sign him, and it can work out amazing. I Not also so amazing. think Edmonton, with how well he worked with McDavid and Dre, would yeah. be stupid to not try to keep him around just sure. from a hockey stamp in general either. I think when it comes to me, my wild card guy, because I've always kind of thought he was a player that – gets bashed by the media and I usually try to think that that gets overblown a lot. And I think it did with this guy. Domi uh, for me is a guy that's a wild card. And I also think Max Domi might have a decent chance of coming here because Max Domi is a kind of a hard nose, sometimes uh, honestly borderline of a prick on the ice in a good yes. way. Uh, so that kind of fits in with what John Tortorella likes in a hockey player. So I would not be surprised if, our 2C next year is Max Domi, and then we're paying our 3C $7 million in uh, Kevin Hayes, which is going to look beautiful on our uh, cap sheet. But uh, the like, I, I think Torch is going to get somebody that he knows can be better. Domi played his best defensive season last year also. Um, 
I think he wants somebody like that. Where Hayes, I don't think. I think the problem with Hayes with Tortoise is going to be his skating speed at this point. Like after his injuries, unless if he's able to get back up to the strides he had two years ago, I don't think Torch is going to play him a lot like people would expect, just because he's not going to be able to do what Torch wants him to do. Well, that's why I think the Flyers need to get another center that can do what that is not Scott Lawton also that can do what Torch. Uh, Wants him to do unless if Torres comes in and really likes Noah Cates and what he did in 13 games because okay well this guy's great at defense and I'm obsessed with defense so screw it we're good but like other other than that I don't really know. Uh, or looks at Lozinski and goes he's fast as shit and good at defense so we're fine we'll figure out how those guys work and if needed I'll tell you to trade for somebody in December so it depends which way he looks at it but if he looks at it as I want to mitigate that risk. Before the season, I could see us getting someone like a Max Domi. Okay. Uh, so you wanted me to throw some NBA names at you there? because Yeah, that would uh, be the last thing as we're wrapping up. Yeah. You know, I, I jotted down some notes about a few players, and two of them are really interesting because they could become free agents, but they have player options that they're expected to pick up. One of them is John Wall, who didn't play at all last year, waiting to be traded. And, of course, he's faced a recent injury issues that, you know, are big question marks. But the last time he played, he's still an amazing player, showed he can produce decent scoring numbers, uh, facilitate an offense. He's expected to pick up his option with Houston, but they would desperately love to trade him still. So, I mean, why would they want to pay him two years in a row to sit on the bench? And a similar situation with Russell Westbrook in L.A., because they'd love to get rid of him. On the one hand... But he's expected to exercise as our option. And now that they have a new coach, they keep saying complimentary things about Westbrook, like he's a big part of this team, blah, blah, blah. We know he didn't fit in well. It sounds like Ellie's going to suck it up and once again go for it with Westbrook in the, line, Westbrook in the lineup. And I think that's really, really going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, the third name is someone you might want to pipe in is James Harden. Because uh, <clears throat> I know the Sixers fans have their frustrations with the beer, and that's something we talked about last time I was on. But this trade certainly worked out a lot better for Philly than it did for the Nets. Um, he played big minutes in Brooklyn side, more in Philly, but his bucket count dropped substantially with the Sixers. His shooting took a big step back the, this season and was even worse in the playoffs. And I'm wondering if you're signing for Harden, which Harden are you getting? You know, the MVP yeah. candidate, the guy that likes to defer. And we, we've talked about that in the past. Does Philly go after, does Philly try to re-sign Harden or do they let him walk? No, yeah, that's a very good. Uh, I completely concur with that point. Very good point. Um, I, I, I think at this point with uh, Harden, you're at a time of like, you really have to come down to the decision in like the next few weeks and sit down with Maury, sit down with Doc stuff because you can't let this linger on. Somebody else will grab him, and then you have to go try to grab a Bradley Beal or something like that. Uh, so. Yeah, I agree with that. I think somebody, to me, that's always an interesting free agent. I've always liked this guy as a shooter. I think any team that just wants a good shooter should go out and get Joe Ingles. Joe Ingles? Always... No, Joe Ingles, the left Joe shooter, Ingles, sorry, like sorry. I just shooter. dropped off for a second. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. He's a great shooter. You want a shooter and score, Bradley Beal's available. Kyrie Irving was, comes with his oh, yeah, own brand of question team. marks yeah, of... Yeah, guys I'm looking at, Gary Harris, Zach Levine, Ricky Rubio. There's some big names out there. You know the team I'm going to pay most attention to this offseason is Brooklyn. They were built to win a title, but they didn't wind up winning a single game in the playoffs. And they have as many – they may have as many as nine free agents to deal with this summer. Oh, my God, what are they going to do? And you know what? I say good on them. I love seeing Brooklyn struggle because I'm not a fan at all. So I'm going to enjoy it from that perspective. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm not the fan of the Nets either being a Sixers fan. But Roto Rob, I really thank you for uh, joining. Hopefully, after the draft and when draft stuff goes on, it would be fun. Like I told Mark uh, to have you guys on after that, so we can talk about if we're mad, happy, sad in between, yeah, uh, whatever we're feeling after the drafts <laughs> for the NBA and NHL, um, and if the picks get traded for either or both, uh, what we're feeling about that as well. But everybody have a great, safe, and pleasant day. Uh, if you had any, did you have anything you wanted to share, uh, Roto Rob, before we go? <clears throat> no, no, just follow me on Twitter at Roto Rob. You know, and yeah, that's about it. 
All right, well, thank you for joining us for this edition of the Sports Fanatic News Sportscast, where we went into the Philadelphia 76ers, the Philadelphia Flyers a little bit, and we talked about the NHL Stanley Cup and the NBA Finals. So we had a big four-prong show together for you that was a pretty decently longer show than we expected to go, but, you know, it was a good flowing (laughs) show, so I think you'll all like it. Stay safe, everybody, and peace out. Please continue to hit that sub button down below. Really appreciate your love and support.